Hi, I'm Seamless, and today is Friday, which means it's time for a new how to bass tutorial. And today I'm going to show you how to make this sound. You can kind of, you can sort of hear some noise happening right now. It's kind of funny because to me it sounds like someone mowing a lawn in the vast distance. But uh, that's actually because of the flangers I have involved in this. They, when they're automatically moving with their internal LFO, it's changing phases and things by their by their methods they choose to do so. And that is creating tiny bits of noise, which through incredible distortion, incredible compression, is making it audible. And if I actually... Yeah. Let's stop it at a certain point so you can hear it actually get kind of uh, a lot. Anyway. So this sound begins life as a sine wave. This doesn't look like a sine wave, and in fact, it doesn't present harmonics as a sine wave, but it is a sine wave inside Zitrus. And the way that we get from a sine wave to this waveform is that we are using the tension and the skew uh, waveform uh, uh, morphing things. The tension just creates distortion one way or, one way or another. And then, uh, like, this, if you were to sort a sine wave, this is what it would look like, with the, depending on the kind of wave shape that you applied. And then the skew ironically, <laughs> I guess it's not really ironically, but essentially what this is doing is what the bend plus and minus does. Actually, this is the bend minus, I think. So it, it's a particular direction, so instead of going outwards, it goes inwards. I'm explaining it to you in that particular method, uh, that particular way is because you should, from that, should be able to figure out a way to do that inside something like Serum or even Massive. And so you do the two of these together and you get this. Without all of the funky jazz, this is what that sounds like. Not really a lot. This actually, this whole thing actually began because I wanted to um, do another just a sine wave thing, but I felt that it needed just a little bit more harmonic help from the source sound. The, so basically, I made this first row here. This guy, these these four guys. This is two high pass filters, essentially after two, two different kinds of distortion. This is distortion, and then this is distortion. This was um, bipolar distortion, but I thought it better with just single polar. This is bipolar, and then when I and then I cloned it so that it has this guy and then this guy happening at the same time. So these are parallel. These are high passes, and these are band passes. So when they're playing. This is this is doing the high pass and this is doing the band pass. A high pass and a band pass in terms of their influence on the sound are pretty close to each other, but they're not necessarily identical. And the primary difference being that the band pass when it goes on low, you don't hear high frequencies, but a high pass when it goes on low, you, you're hearing high frequencies until it goes high, pretty much forever. The high pass is actually principally what's responsible for creating the type of gravel we're hearing here, but the, the fun thing about what we're doing is that the band pass and the, and the high pass are both linked to the same automation clip, so they're moving I, together. Uh, so if I played if I played just this guy, so this is after all the distortion as well. You can hear that like a lot of it's just what is what that's about. Now it's important that like we're distorting we're st distorting it to create essentially interesting harmonic behavior from the source sound, and then we're high passing that, and then we're distorting that which got high passed to create even more interesting harmonic behavior, and then we're high passing it again, but differently. This is the second automation clip. And there's also a little bit of EQing going on in there just to, you know, balance things. And then I involved flangers. So the kind of ringy nature you're hearing about it is actually coming from the flanger. Um, uh, the high feedback nature, the high feedback is what's causing that. And then uh, high delay and high depth value. And then I'm just letting it do its own motion. I'm not really automating it, so I'm just letting it do its own thing. I alter the cross fade, or the cross over, rather, which determines um, stereo phase. And it's also controlled through the phase option, which I didn't think I moved. And then, so less cross is actually, actually, I guess it's more cross. I'm not totally sure. But let, let, yeah, it's less cross. Less crossover means that it's actually more stereo. And I think, I forget how it determines how it does that, but that's just essentially what it means. Um, I did the same thing with the other guy, just slightly different settings, just so that it wasn't really identical. The point, the purpose of separating the two chains like this is to merge them into that they're somewhat similar, but also somewhat different, and that they combine in an interesting way. And then uh, the, all of that together gets compressed into this guy. And this is just a big multi-band, kind of crunching it all together, kind of like I would do with when I'm doing... Um, like when I do uh, the crazy band passing notching 
for like, like filtering stuff. I just did more or less that with, with the whole Baker version. And then I put it into a Vogadex. And that's where the primary tone sort of morphing came into play. Now, what I like to do with Vocodex these days is I do very low voice counts because by default you're at 47, so I did half of that more or less in the 24 settings. Um, it will matter sort of how many voices you use. <laughs> I just happened to calibrate all the settings to work in a way that sounds pleasing to me at 24 bands. Full order, so I was really, you know, vocoding pretty hard. The bandwidth is is sort of set, but I'm also changing a bit. This this graph is altering the bandwidth very slightly. And again, like, just because it was just what it's always sounded good to me. There weren't really practical reasons for that. Um, I, I changed the pitch a little bit. So like when you send a sound through a vocoder and you don't send it with anything else with it, that means it becomes its own carrier and its modulator. And this means that it's imparting... You're, you're moving essentially the formant qualities down a bit and it doesn't always work out well but it tends to work out well for things that already have pretty pronounced uh formanty vowelly talky nature which because of the high passing it definitely does definitely 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 does not a whole lot else happening and by not a whole lot else i mean absolutely nothing else happening here um, I am letting a little bit of the low pass through but we don't actually need to do that because i have high passed it after the um the vocoder so that uh, it, when it goes into the compressor, it goes into the compressor, which is the high pass. And then this is a low pass from the source, the original source, to make up the low end. So this chain does a lot of stuff, but it's also, also very important to realize that because we used a relatively simple source sound, this means that we can actually change quite a lot of the character just by altering tiny bits of the original source. If I actually alter the source, there it is. Like just that one parameter made it kind of interesting. And again, this is basically the result of, of what would be distortion. Uh, so if you did the skew thing and then you alter like this downward tone where it kind of like squeezes up instead of opening up is logarithmic distortion or exposed to, exposed to exponential. If you want to do that with a wave shaper, what you would do is you would uh, do that instead of this in case you're curious about that. <laughs> If I make it real sharp like that, you can actually hear very very clearly the the effect of the phaser. Or the flanges, rather. I get the two confused because they're primarily the same function. So yeah. The chain is obviously very important, but when you do things to very simple starting positions, then the changing, essentially the farther back the chain you can make changes, the larger the impact will be. And of course, we're also doing it with the automation and the pitch mod is actually very important. And by the pitch mod, I mean what I'm doing with the MIDI. So you notice how when I am up high, I start up going high when it comes down. And say more, I'll do more or less the same thing over here. And, it's, and if I were to start low, you can see how there's a tiny bit, there's just a different kind of, uh, not really the difference you'd expect. And this has to do with the fact that we're doing all this live. What I mean by that is that you might be used to be you might be used to using re recordings or wavetables or, or something like that or reset the systems of, of some kind, and when you do that, that means that the overall impact of the spectral positions, like the filtering and all that kind of stuff, the forward qualities moves with the pitch. But if you move the pitch through that kind of thing, as to say that the harmonics are moving around underneath where, like you know, essentially a static position that you're moving the filter, then it creates an interesting 
combo of movement. So pitch movement is very important in, in how the sounds react. I also put in that really low tone down there because uh, not everyone knows that if, you, if for a lot of these crunchy, growly sounds, the really ridiculously low, like rear toothy versions of it are really just it playing it at lower octave. So, yeah, that's basically the sound. I'll put up this FLP for download in the description of this video. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.